Hello and welcome to Live Notes, an introduction to Imperial College's lunchtime concert series run by the Blythe Centre for Music and Visual Arts. My name is Dr. Bruno Bauer. I'm an evening class lecturer in music at Imperial. And today I'm going to introduce the performance by Onyx Brass, featuring a range of original music and arrangements for brass quintet. They are also joined by some of our own Imperial students for two fanfares, bookending the performance you're about to see. The first of these is Herbert Howells's Fanfare for Schools, written in 1943 during his stint as acting organist in St John's College, Cambridge. He was there 1941 to 1945. This fanfare is part of a diverse output from what seems to have been a productive period in his life, during which time he wrote works for choir, organ, symphony orchestra, string orchestra, and various pieces of chamber music. It's bright, it's crisp, it's uplifting, and it's brief, but it's nonetheless a lovely showcase for the polished playing of the imperial performers who join the quintet for this piece. Next, we head towards the Renaissance with the Agnus Dei from William Byrd's Mass for Five Voices. This is one of three Latin mass settings that Byrd wrote in the 1590s, almost certainly for the private chapel of a Catholic family. This was risky business at the time with the deeply anti-Catholic Elizabeth I on the throne and Catholics up and down the country fearing state retribution for maintaining their faith. The lengthy, drawn out lines uh, with little concern for whether we would understand the words, it's in Latin, not everyone understands Latin anyway. These are clear hallmarks of the Catholic musical style of the time. Dan Jenkins's arrangement works so well for five players, given that it was in five voices to start with and the performance by Onyx Brass has a beautifully sung quality fitting with the original style. This is then followed by Guy Wolfenden's Full Fathom Five, uh, which is based on some of the music he wrote for the Royal Shakespeare Company's production of The Tempest in 1978. The title refers to the words that Ariel sings trying to convince Ferdinand that Ferdinand's father, Alonso, the King of Naples, has drowned in the shipwreck that landed Ferdinand on Prospero's island. Full fathom five, thy father lies, of his bones are coral made, those are pearls that were his eyes. All of the material in this three movement piece derives from the song that Wolfenden wrote for those words, which explains the overall melancholy air for the whole piece. The first movement has a brief solemn opening, but then doesn't lose the air of uncertainty as things pick up and get jazzier. Mutes for instruments all round give this uncertainty a new creepy menacing air at the start of the second movement with just a brief moment of light shining through the clouds towards the end of that movement. A tiptoeing tuba underpins some more playful or jazzy lines from the other instruments at the start of the third movement, eventually leading to a happy ending but not before passing through a rather mournful chorale. Continuing on from some of the syncopated rhythms in the Wolfenden, we then have George Gershwin's prelude novelette in fourths, arranged by Tim Jackson. The comparatively spacious tone here derives from the gliding movement of a cakewalk, which is what this piece is. Gershwin probably composed this piece in 1919, and there's an echo in it of Debussy's cakewalk from his sweet children's corner. And that maybe owes something to the influence that Gershwin's mentor, Charles Ambitzer, 
had Hambitzer had. Uh, Hambitzer, the one responsible for introducing Gershwin to the European piano music that up until that point, Gershwin had had little opportunity of hearing. Still, this piece, the novelette, also has that jazzy sound that Gershwin was clearly so adept at already. And there are plenty of tunes in thirds in the middle, as well as the fourths in the recurring opening melody. Amos Miller, the trombonist for Onyx Brass, provides a fairly extensive spoken introduction for the next piece, Brass Quintet No. 1 by Malcolm Arnold. It's clear that he really loves this music. So I won't say too much about it, but I just want to echo his point that this really is superb music. It contains some of the most extraordinary writing out there for a brass chamber ensemble. Listen in particular to the exceptionally virtuosic writing for the tuba in the first movement, to say nothing of the challenges that all the other instruments have to overcome. You will also be able to enjoy all of the musical surprises that Arnold has in store for you along the way. He really excels at the comedic pause or the sudden swerve into a style you weren't expecting at all. You get quite a few of these in the outer movements, which come either side of a central slow movement that has some really quite terrifying darkness in it. We then go back to popular styles for Joseph Lacalle's Amapola, arranged as Pretty Little Poppy by Tim Jackson. Dating from 1920, this piece is so lyrical, even in the instrumental form, that you'd probably be able to tell, even without me telling you, that this piece was originally a song, and one with Spanish lyrics, written by Lacalle himself. This was one of Lacalle's major hits, extensively performed and arranged even at the time, appearing for instrumental ensembles and in versions with new English words, uh, and covers by artists such as the D Jimmy Dorsey Orchestra, Spike Jones, and Bing Crosby. Countless artists have had a crack at it over the years, and Tim Jackson's inventive adaptation brings that tradition right up to the 21st century, with a little hint of The Wizard of Oz thrown in for good measure. I feel there's probably an in-joke in there somewhere, but I have no idea what it is. Finally, we have Arnold Bax's Salute to Sydney. Again, a lovely showcase for the imperial performers who join the ensemble. This is written in 1943, the same year as the Howells fanfare we heard at the beginning. Bax's fanfare was composed for a BBC overseas broadcast celebrating Australia's contribution to the defense of the Commonwealth. The choice of Bax for the occasion was very likely motivated by the fact that he had been made master of the King's music in 1941, making him the most obvious choice for what is essentially a moment of musical diplomacy. It's also brief, it's also uplifting, but perhaps has a more noble sung quality compared with the shorter notes that we heard in the Howells fanfare at the beginning. I hope you enjoy the performance. Do stay tuned for further lunchtime concerts from the Blythe Centre as they appear in due course. Thank you for listening. Thank <laughs> you. 
Welcome everyone to this concert hosted by Imperial College. Lovely to be here. We're on X Brass, uh, and that was an annual day from the Bird Mass for Five Voices, arranged for us by a great friend of ours called Dan Jenkins. And whilst we're talking about friends, I think it's worth mentioning it's a very slightly different looking Onyx Brass today. Um, the coronavirus has made all our lives more complicated, um, and it certainly had its mini impact on Onyx Brass. So we've got two guest players with us today, but we're absolutely over the moon to be joined by two great friends of ours, also incredibly distinguished musicians in their own right. We're very lucky to have Phil Cobb and Ryan Linham with us today. So thank you to them for joining us. Um, we're going to carry on now with some music by Guy Wolfenden, who very sadly died only a few years ago. We were very lucky to meet him, actually, because we did a concert in one of his local churches and he popped in. Uh, and this is a lovely piece. Guy was the, uh, the musical director of the Royal Shakespeare Company for many years. And this quintet piece he wrote for the Fine Arts Brass, and it's an adaptation of quite a few themes that he used in his production of The Tempest at uh, Stratford. Uh, and it's in three movements, so this is Full Fathom Five by Guy Walker.
Firstly, uh, not much of George Gershwin's music is currently out of copyright because uh, he wrote most of his music in partnership with his brother Ira, who wrote all the words. And George, sadly, tragically, was taken from this planet at a ridiculously early age. And for a man whose uh, tune smithery was so incredible, that's a real tragedy. Um, and this piece we're going to play now is a very fresh arrangement. It's only the second time we've ever played it. And it's an arrangement of a little piano prelude called Novelette in Force. Um, <coughs> there's a lovely recording of Gershwin uh, playing it himself on a piano roll. It's music of such uh, charm that it's one of those things you could probably arrange it for a kazoo choir and it would still sound uh, enchanting. Hopefully we will sound a little bit nicer than that, though. Uh, this is arranged by our composer in association, Tim Jackson, who is um, 
a very, very talented man. He's a principal horn of the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra and also oversees all the publishing that uh, we do as a, as a group of all our music. Um, and it's, yeah, just a lovely piece. Prelude Novelette in Force by George Gershwin, arranged by Tim Jackson. The next piece we're going to play is the brilliant Quintet No. 1 by Malcolm Arnold. Malcolm Arnold started his musical career as uh, one of the trumpet players of the London Philharmonic Orchestra and he always demonstrated through his entire compositional life a real understanding and empathy for brass writing. His writing is always very challenging but it is always, with a bit of effort, playable. 
Um, he realized quite soon after starting with the LPO that uh, his talents were possibly even more profitable by going to, to film music writing, and he was the winner of an Oscar for his movie soundtrack, The Bridge Over the River Kwai. Um, and I think this particular piece, this quintet number one, it's the reason why uh, a lot of brass quintets start up in the first place. It's, it's, a, it's played a lot for good reason. We've been playing it for 27 years now. Um, so we started playing when, Lina, when, um, when Ryan was minus three, I think, um, uh, which is a somewhat sobering thought. And it, is, uh, it was written originally for the New York City Brass Quintet in the late 1950s, and it is a staple for good reason. It's a tour de force. It's in three movements. Um, each movement features similar sort of uh, musical uh, battles going on. The two trumpets spar with each other throughout. The horn and the tuba spar with each other throughout the whole piece and the trombone does its level best to sort of spoil things quite frequently, which really suits me down to the ground personally. Um, and the first movement is called the Allegro Vivace. The second movement is a Chacon, which is a, um, a variation over a repeated harmonic movement. Um, and this, the Chacon is one of the sort of darkest bits of writing I know of Miles Myles, apart from possibly the Seventh Symphony. Um, and it's very, very sort of angry and turbulent. It is very powerful music. And it finishes off with a very, very brilliant uh, Con Brio. So this is Malcolm Arnold's quintet number one for two trumpets, French horn, trombone, and tuba. Thank you. 
Thank you. 
This is uh, a very uh, famous uh, song from the 1920s, 1930s by Joseph Lacalle. It's been arranged into all sorts of different types of dance. Um, and this is Tim Jackson's version of Amapola, Pretty Little Poppy. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for watching and listening and we Onyx would like to thank very very much the students from Imperial College who have joined us in these two rousing fanfares they've done a terrific job 
Um, rehearsal has been very uh, short and they've slotted in beautifully. We hope that they've enjoyed the experience as much as we have. We'd also really like to thank Imperial College, especially Oliver Gooch, for keeping this brilliant series of concerts going uh, in this very strange time for so many people. Uh, it's been such a joy for us to come back here and um, play to you all again, albeit on a computer screen this time. Hopefully next time it will be live. Thank you very much for watching and for listening.